In this lecture, we'll try to get a grip on the entire history of the universe. History means what happened over time, so we need to add the dimension of time to our discussion. We've seen that a good way to describe the expanding universe is with the cosmological scale factor, A of t. The distance between any pair of galaxies grows in proportion to A. But what equation determines how A varies with time? It's called the Friedman equation, and we will approach it in stages. Physicists always seek the simplest model for any phenomenon. Maybe you've heard the old joke about a dairy farmer who asks a physicist for advice on how to get his cows to produce more milk. Physicist thinks about it for a while, scribbles some equations, then says, start by assuming the cow is a sphere. Likewise, we will start by assuming the entire universe is a sphere, an enormous sphere of uniform density. It's only if we look closely that we see the specks of dust spread throughout the volume. Those are galaxies. We'll focus our attention on an arbitrary galaxy at a distance r from the center. What determines how it moves with time? The only force is gravity. And from Newton's theorem, the gravitational acceleration is directed inward with a magnitude g times m sub r over r squared, where m sub r is the total mass interior to r. Does that equation ring a bell? It's the same one we've solved already during our study of planetary motion and black holes. This case is simpler, though, because there's only one variable, r, instead of r and theta. The trajectory is purely radial. So in this model, the motion of the galaxy is the same of that of a spaceship near a black hole with no more fuel and no angular momentum. Even without solving the equation, we can guess what's going to happen. If the sphere starts from rest, the galaxy will fall inward. All the interior galaxies will fall too, so m sub r will remain constant as the sphere contracts. If the initial condition is a Hubble expansion, an expanding sphere with initial velocity proportional to distance, then gravity will slow it down. Whether a galaxy eventually gets pulled back or escapes to infinity depends on how the initial speed compares to the escape velocity. We can visualize the possible outcomes with the graphical method, as we did for planets and black holes. We start by writing the total energy of the galaxy. E equals 1 half mv squared minus gmm over r. We rearrange that to write the kinetic energy as the difference between the total energy and the potential energy. Before, we had another term, L squared over 2mr squared, but in this case, L equals zero. Then we sketch the potential energy as a function of r, and we make a horizontal line at the level e. The square of the speed at any location is proportional to the difference between the two lines, e minus the potential energy. Suppose E is positive, and a galaxy starts with an initially outward speed. As the galaxy advances with time, the difference between E and the potential energy shrinks, so the galaxy slows down. As R goes to infinity, the potential energy becomes irrelevant, and the speed approaches the square root of 2E over M. That describes a universe that expands forever, coasting at a constant speed. If the energy is negative, then the lines cross at a certain point. In this case, the galaxy advances to that point, where it stops, turns around, and falls back toward the origin. This would be a universe that expands for a while, then ends up collapsing into a black hole. And in between these two cases is a special case, when the total energy is exactly zero. That's like a spaceship with an initial speed exactly equal to the escape velocity. It corresponds to a universe that keeps expanding, but at an ever-decreasing rate. In this model, 
the fate of the universe depends on its total energy. If we could measure the total energy of the universe, we'd be able to determine its fate. There is a problem, though. On scales of gigaparsecs, we need to describe the universe with general relativity, not classical mechanics. To prepare for general relativity, we're going to dress up the energy equation in different clothing. First, let's divide through by little m, converting everything to units of energy per unit mass. And since E over m is a constant, let's just call it k. Now, let's bring in the scale factor. Instead of r of t, we'll write a of t times r0, where r0 is an arbitrarily chosen distance scale, say, 100 megaparsecs, the distance from the Milky Way to the coma cluster. With that, the velocity, dr dt, becomes dA dt times r0. And finally, instead of the enclosed mass, we'll write the equation in terms of the density of the universe, rho of t. We'll replace m sub r by 4 pi over 3 r cubed times rho. When we make all those substitutions, and then tidy up by multiplying both sides by 2 and dividing by a r0 squared, the end result is the square of 1 over a dA dt equals 2k over a squared r0 squared plus 8 pi g over 3 times rho. The quantity on the left side, 1 over a dA dt, might look familiar. It's the Hubble parameter, h, as we showed a couple of lectures ago. And with that change of notation, voila, we've derived the classical Friedman equation. In this new guise, the equation relates the cosmological scale factor and its time derivative to the overall density of the universe at any given time. This allows us to rephrase our statements about the fate of the universe in terms of its density. The critical case of zero total energy corresponds to k equals zero. In that case, h squared equals 8 pi g over 3 times rho. Another way to put it is that there's a critical density of 3 h squared over 8 pi g. If the actual density equals the critical density, the universe expands forever at ever-decreasing speed. If the density is higher, the universe collapses. And if it's lower, the universe ends up coasting at a constant speed. So in this model, destiny depends on density. So to figure out what's going to happen to our universe, we need to measure the density and compare it to the critical density. The current value of the critical density is 3 times h0 squared over 8 pi g, where h0 is the Hubble constant, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Plugging that in gives a critical density of 9 times 10 to the minus 30 grams per cubic centimeter. A more interesting way to express that is 5.5 proton masses per cubic meter. That seems like a pretty low bar for the universe to jump over to achieve the critical density. Surely the actual universe is denser than that. The air in this room has a density of 10 to the 27 proton masses per cubic meter. And what about all the dark matter? But we need to be careful. We need to remember the universe is gigantic and most of it is empty space. Think of those vast expanses between the stars within a galaxy and the voids of nothingness in that cosmic web of galaxies. To measure the average density, we need to assess a representative volume of the universe, large enough for entire galaxies to be like specks of dust. When astronomers did that throughout the 1980s and 90s, they found the universe does have an average density on the same order of a few proton masses per cubic meter. Even the dark matter, it turns out, is very dilute. This remarkable result suggested the universe is in that perfectly balanced state with zero total energy. Most cosmologists found that possibility to be compelling. Zero 
seems like the most natural possible value for the total energy. But the funny thing is, as the measurements got better, a density equal to the critical density was ruled out. The actual average density of matter is only 30% of the critical density. This rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Why should the density be of the same order of magnitude as the critical density, but not quite equal to it? Many theorists suspected the density really is equal to the critical density, but the measurements were off. Maybe for some reason astronomers were still missing a lot of the dark matter. Let's see where that logic leads. We'll solve the Friedman equation and find A of t for that special case of k equals zero. In that case, the equation says 1 over a dA dt, the quantity squared, equals 8 pi g over 3 times rho. Both a and rho are functions of time, but they're linked by the fact that rho is mass over volume. And since the total mass isn't changing, rho must be proportional to 1 over a cubed. That implies 1 over a dA dt squared is proportional to 1 over a cubed. Or equivalently, a times dA dt squared is a constant. From there, we take the square root and then integrate to find that a to the 3 halves power is proportional to time, or a is proportional to t to the 2 thirds. We've just learned that the cosmological scale factor grows with time, but not at a constant rate. Expansion at a constant rate would imply a is proportional to t. Gravity decelerates the expansion, making it go like t to the two-thirds instead. Since we've agreed to use units such that a equals 1 at the current time, t naught, we can write a as t over t naught to the two-thirds power. And we can calculate the value of t naught, the current age of the universe, based on the measured value of the Hubble constant. In general, h equals 1 over a dA dt, which in this case is 1 over a times the derivative of t over t naught to the two-thirds power. When we take that derivative and evaluate it at time t naught, the left side is the Hubble constant, h naught, and the right side is 2 over 3 t naught. That means t naught equals 2 over 3 h naught. Plugging in 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec for h naught, the age of the universe comes out to be 9.3 billion years. A chart of a versus t shows that a starts at time zero, rises, crosses through unity at a time of 9.3 billion years, and keeps growing as t to the two-thirds forever. So we did it. We figured out the history of the universe. Actually, not quite. There's a problem. The sun may be only 5 billion years old, but some other stars in the galaxy appear to be 13 billion years old. In particular, there are a few globular clusters in which stars of the same mass as the Sun have already started evolving into giants. That takes more than 10 billion years. How could the stars have had time to do that? How could they be older than the entire universe? You might think that the issues that we've just discussed, the density not quite equaling the critical density, and getting the wrong age for the universe, are both artifacts of an oversimplified model. And it's true, they are. To model the universe correctly, we need to use general relativity. And the relativistic version of the Friedman equation solves these problems. But it solves them in a very surprising way. More than that, in a shocking and disturbing way. Let me explain. In general relativity, when you work out the problem analogous to the expanding sphere of uniform density, you find three features that don't show up in the classical Friedman equation. The simplest new feature is an extra constant on the right side. 
It's a constant of integration that you get when deriving the Friedman equation from Einstein's more general field equations. Following convention, we'll write that new constant as capital lambda over 3, and lambda itself is called the cosmological constant. A subtler change is that rho isn't just mass over volume. Relativity teaches us that energy and mass are related, E equals mc squared. So particles that are essentially pure energy, like photons and neutrinos, also affect the expansion of the universe. We have to understand rho as the density of matter plus the energy density of all the radiation divided by c squared. The most subtle change is that k, that constant representing energy per unit mass in the classical model, now acquires a deeper interpretation. It specifies the curvature of space. If k equals zero, space is flat. What I mean is that geometry works just like you learned in high school. But if k isn't zero, space is curved, and the usual rules of geometry don't apply. The best way to understand is to imagine a two-dimensional universe. If k equals zero, then the universe is like an endless flat sheet of paper. You can do your geometry homework on it. Two parallel lines will never meet. The sum of all the angles in a triangle is 180 degrees, and so on. But if k is less than zero, the universe is curved like the surface of a sphere. You can try to do your geometry homework on it, but you're going to get some weird answers. If you draw two lines that start out parallel at the equator, and you continue them as straight as you can, they eventually cross at the North Pole. Or if you draw a triangle by connecting three points with the shortest possible paths, the sum of the angles is more than 180 degrees. On the other hand, if k is greater than zero, then the universe is curved like an infinite saddle, or a Pringles potato chip. Here, parallel lines always diverge, and triangles have angles that sum to less than 180 degrees. This new interpretation of k is fascinating, and it gives us another way to measure k in the real universe. If you were trapped on a giant, featureless surface, how could you tell if you were living on a flat sheet, or a sphere, or a saddle? You're stuck on just a tiny patch of the surface with no way to get a bird's eye view. One way would be to draw a triangle and measure the angles. You'd want to draw as big a triangle as possible to exaggerate the effects of any curvature. Then, see if they add up to 180 or not. Now, the real universe has three dimensions of space, making curvature difficult or impossible to visualize, but the logic is the same. And this experiment with a triangle has been done over the past couple of decades, and the result is clear. K is equal to zero within a few percent. Our universe is flat. Now, of course, nobody literally went around in a rocket ship with a marker drawing big triangles. The experiments are less direct. They're based on the cosmic microwave background radiation. In the last lecture, I showed you the slight irregularities in the CMB, the hot and cold spots that differ in temperature in the fourth decimal place. Those are from acoustic waves propagating through the hot plasma of the early universe, up until the time of recombination. I called attention to the point that the physical size of these hot and cool spots can be calculated from first principles. Let's call that typical size s. It's also possible to calculate the distance d over which the photons have traveled since the epoch of recombination. And that's enough information to draw a triangle. We're here on Earth. There's a hot spot way over there, and we can draw a triangle using the hotspot, S, as one side, and the lines of sight to the edges of the hotspot as the other two sides, each with a length, D. 
It's a long, skinny triangle. We can also measure the angular size of the spot on the sky, theta. It's about one degree. And then we can check if good old high school geometry works. If the universe is flat, then the usual formula for angular size should hold. Theta equals s over d. But if the universe is curved like a sphere, the rays of light from opposite ends of the spot would converge as they travel toward us. We would find theta to be larger than s over d. Likewise, if the universe were Pringle-shaped, the rays would diverge and theta would be smaller than s over d. All the available data show that theta is equal to s over d to within a few percent. So even though Einstein's theory allows for more exotic possibilities, the actual universe seems to be flat. This implies k equals zero, and the universe has exactly the critical density. Wait, something's not right. This finding seems to contradict the one I mentioned earlier that measurements of the total amount of matter in the universe on the largest scales imply the density is only 30% of the critical density. From just those measurements, we would have expected k to be greater than 1 and the universe to be curved like a Pringle. But the evidence in the CMB speaks with a clear voice, k equals 0. So let's set aside that contradiction for now. If k is really 0, the Friedman equation simplifies to h squared equals 8 pi g over 3 times rho plus lambda over 3. Now, about that constant term, lambda over 3, physically it doesn't make any sense. The best way to see that is to factor out 8 pi g so that the lambda term is now being added directly to rho. This makes clear that a constant value of lambda has the same effect in the equation as a density that's constant in time, which is crazy because the density of anything should go down as the universe expands. If A grows by a factor of 2, then the mass density goes down by a factor of 8. But the lambda term would stay the same, like a type of mass that can't be diluted, as if each new cubic centimeter of the expanding universe came into existence filled with new mass or energy. So lambda seems like a purely mathematical artifact. Any reasonable universe must have lambda equals zero. And don't just take my word for it. Take it from Einstein himself. He originally thought lambda would be a negative number so that it would cancel out the rho and zero out the right side of the equation. That's because Einstein was working before Hubble. Einstein thought the universe was stationary, so he wanted dA dt to equal zero. Years later, after he learned about the evidence for an expanding universe, he regretted this decision. In a letter to a colleague, he wrote, Since I have introduced this lambda term, I had always a bad conscience. I found it very ugly indeed that the field law of gravitation should be composed of two logically independent terms which are connected by addition. I am unable to believe that such an ugly thing should be realized in nature. Other cosmologists agreed and were happy to set lambda equal to zero. In which case, the Friedman equation becomes very simple indeed. h squared equals 8 pi g over 3 times rho. It's the same as the classical equation. That was quite a hayride. All that stuff about matter-energy equivalence and curved space and all the rest, all to get right back to the same equation where we started. It seems like none of the relativistic stuff mattered. Let's review the story so far. Measurements of the density of the universe came up with 30% of the critical density. On its own, that implies the universe will expand forever, that its current age is less than 9.3 billion years, and that space is curved like a Pringle. However, some globular clusters appear to be 13 billion years old, and observations of the CMB imply space is flat as a pancake. 
What happened next is that in the mid-1990s, astronomers started getting good at discovering Type 1a supernovae in distant galaxies. Remember, Type 1a's act like standard candles. You can determine the distance based on the flux-luminosity relationship. And you can measure the redshift of the galaxy where the supernova took place. So each new supernova adds a new data point to the Hubble diagram. And astronomers were adding them at ever greater distances and higher redshifts. The distance, divided by C, tells us how much time has elapsed since the supernova went off. And the redshift, Z, tells us the value of the cosmological scale factor at that time. We derived the relationship earlier. It's 1 over A equals 1 plus Z. So we can convert the redshift distance data into a chart of A versus time. Our solution of the Friedman equation said that A should be growing like T to the two-thirds. We can plot that curve. We need to make sure A is equal to 1 at the present day, and the slope is equal to the Hubble constant. That curve hits A equals 0 at a time 9.3 billion years in the past. We can also plot some other cases. If gravity were irrelevant and the universe were just coasting along, we would see A is proportional to T. That would be a straight line through A equals 1, with the same slope as the other curve. And if the density were higher than the critical density, the universe would recollapse. The model curve goes up and then down. So now let's take a look at the supernova data. Which of these models turns out to be closest to the truth? The answer is none of them. The data points are higher than any of the curves. What does that mean? Well, if we want to connect the data points to the present day, when a equals 1 and the slope is h0, we need to draw a curve that bends upward. The scale factor is not just increasing. The rate of increase has grown with time. The expansion of the universe is not decelerating, and it's not coasting. It's accelerating. Now that seems absurd. It's easy to understand why the expansion rate might be slowing down from the attraction of gravity. But what would speed it up? For that, you would need some kind of anti-gravity. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that is where the data have led us. We have reached the number one unsolved problem in astrophysics. Cosmologists, astronomers, and particle physicists have united in the effort to understand what's going on. The phenomenon itself, this force or substance that propels the expansion of the universe with ever-increasing speed, has become known as dark energy, in analogy with dark matter. But it's just a label. We're completely in the dark to its true nature. But you know what might have something to do with it? Good old lambda. That integration constant that we so casually discarded a few minutes ago on the advice of Albert Einstein. Lambda might have a physical meaning after all. Let's go back to the Friedman equation, but this time we'll retain the lambda and see what happens. In an expanding universe, as time goes on, rho goes down. Matter and radiation get diluted. But lambda, being a constant, persists. So eventually we must reach a point at which we can neglect the rho term altogether. That implies 1 over a dA dt is a constant, an equation for which the solution is exponential growth. So that could be what we're observing today, a transition in the history of the universe when the gravitational attraction of ordinary matter has been overcome by a universal repulsive force represented by the cosmological constant. Fitting the supernova data to an upwardly bending line also has the effect of increasing the calculated age of the universe. The curve doesn't cross A equals zero until all the way back to 14 billion years ago. 
So the cosmological constant solves the problem of the stars that appear to be older than the universe. It also explains how the universe can be spatially flat, even though the density of matter is less than the critical density. We saw earlier that in the Friedman equation, lambda over 8 pi g acts like a density that gets added to rho. According to the data, the actual rho is 30% of the critical density, and that lambda term makes up the other 70%. So even though we don't understand dark energy, once we invoke it, everything fits together. Let me sum up the current situation by taking you through the history of the universe as we know it, with a logarithmic chart of A versus T. This is what you get when you solve the Friedman equation, including the effects of matter, radiation, and the dark energy, all at the numerical values consistent with the data from type 1a supernovae, the cosmic microwave background, and numerous other sources. The model predicts that in the future, the scale factor will continue rising exponentially. The ultimate fate of the universe is to dilute itself to near nothingness. Nobody will be able to see anything outside their own galaxy. It'll be a lonelier universe. Looking back in time, we see that up until a few billion years ago, the scale factor was increasing as t to the two-thirds. The density of ordinary matter was high enough to be more important than dark energy. It was during this period that all the mass in the universe started clumping under its own gravity, collapsing into galaxies, stars, black holes, and all the rest. Before that, the universe was a nearly featureless hot plasma. About 380,000 years after the Big Bang was the epoch of recombination. That's when the universe had cooled to around 3,000 Kelvin, the point when electrons and ions could get together and become atoms without fear of getting ionized. Shortly before then was another transition, which you might be able to perceive as a slight change in the slope of the curve. This was when the mass density of the universe became more important than the energy density of radiation. Toward early times, photon wavelengths shrink and energies go up. It's the cosmological redshift, but in reverse. That's why radiation was more important at the earliest times. Even further back, during the first few minutes of time, was the epoch of nucleosynthesis, when the temperature was billions of degrees. That's when protons and neutrons started to gang up together as nuclei. Which leaves us wondering, what happened even earlier than that? What about T equals one microsecond or one nanosecond? What about, dare I even say it, T equals zero? If this were a medieval map, it would say, here there be dragons. We can only speculate, based on theories of fundamental physics, what happened when it was hot enough to disintegrate protons into quarks and disintegrate quarks into whatever lies beneath. I need to end this lecture series with lots of unanswered questions. Fortunately, cosmology is now a data-driven science like the rest of astrophysics. New experiments and telescopes are under construction now to make progress on the nature of dark matter, dark energy, and the birth of the universe. Nobody knows what they'll find, of course. So please stay tuned and check back with me in the next edition of this course.